I want to talk to you today and ask you the question, what do you expect? As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle, and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants? You, Lord, have called forth your praise. And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany, where he spent the night. Can you say amen at the reading of the word of God? Amen. So, what do you expect? Now, when I ask that question, what do you think of? Do you think of past? Do you think of present? Or do you think of future? I think most of you would say future. Because when we use the word expectation, it has to do with thinking ahead. We would say that a woman is expecting a child, right? You see, expectation has to do in your mind with <clears throat> what you think about the future. Expectation is connected to imagination. And I want to put it this way, that expectation is like the oxygen of your faith. Your, what you think about, what you imagine for your future is either going to revive you, it's either going to be something that is positive and reviving, or it's going to suffocate your faith. Because if you imagine the worst, and you think uh, lowly of the things of God and of Jesus, then your future is suffocating. So, I want to talk to you today about that question. What do you expect? Now, Jesus Christ had been on the earth for about three years. And as he went about talking and ministering to people and praying for people, he avoided the spotlight. He kept on telling people that he healed. He said, now don't go and spread this to too many people. Why did he do that? Because he didn't want the clock to be sped up. He had a mission to do, a work to do. But then we read here in Matthew 21, all of a sudden, Jesus doesn't avoid the spotlight. He comes right into it, in the very middle of it. And he says as if to the devil, he says, it's time to bring it on. 
And so, why does Jesus do this? One who is ducking in and out of the spotlight, why is he now front and center? See, what's happening is this. Is God is making the presentation. This is the procession into Jerusalem. God is presenting His Son Jesus to Jerusalem and to the world and to us. He's making the presentation which gives us the opportunity. So Jesus has to do this to fulfill the Old Testament prophecy, but more importantly, He's doing this because of showing Himself as the King. He's saying to the world that a new order is coming. That the promised kingdom of the olden times has now broken like a tsunami onto the land. This has come. You can summarize it all in this one little verse. The Bible says, this is the prediction, Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you. So this entry, this procession into Jerusalem, this laying down of clothes and of palm branches, is God's way of saying to the world, I am giving you my king. And what do you want to do about it? What do you expect? You see, we have a lot of different reactions from the people. And so much of the benefit or the loss that they experience is dependent on their expectations. What do they expect? Now on my computer, I have a lot of uh, news locations, and one of them is the Jerusalem news. I can pull up the Jerusalem news and I can put the Bible right beside it in prophecy and say, wow, look at what's happening. You know, God is fulfilling His Word. But let's just go back. Let's go back in the time of Jesus. In this, uh, we call triumphal entry. And let's pretend that we're a news reporter. Because this is big news. The whole city is a stir. Let's pretend that we're a news reporter and we are going to interview various groups of people asking them what they expect. Okay, so let's start with the crowd. So you're a disciple of Jesus, and you're going around to the crowd, and you ask the people in the crowd, what do you expect from Jesus? Okay? In the crowd, you'll have various responses. But most of the people believe and think that Jesus is a great prophet. Now, in the book of uh, Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, and verse number 15, the Bible predicts, Moses says, that one day there will be a prophet like unto me who will come. Listen to him. And so the people, most of them knowing the Bible, connected Jesus with this special prophet who was to come. Other people thought of Jesus, if you get a microphone in the crowd, other people thought of Jesus as this great miracle worker who was going to do amazing things in the nation of Israel so that the Israelites could be free. For well, you see, at the time Jesus was going into Jerusalem, there were a lot of Roman soldiers around. They were occupying the Promised Land. The Israelites didn't like that. So many of them wanted this Jesus to be the one who would liberate them. Free them all. They wanted their lives to be different. They wanted Jesus to be a great warrior. They didn't see him carrying any weapons, but they thought, you know, he's so popular. We just know he's going to take these uh, disciples and he's going to arm them. He's going to get a lot of other people. We'll drive out these Romans and we'll have it all together. You see, expectation. And you know it's interesting that many of these same people in the crowd who expected Jesus to change their life for the better, make everything easy for us, when Jesus was arrested, these same people turned on him. 
They were angry at Jesus because Jesus, they felt their expectation wasn't met. They wanted Jesus to make life better and easier, and Jesus ends up getting arrested? What a weak, anemic person this Jesus is. We had put our hope in him, and now he's just a miserable failure. So yeah, crucify the guy. You know, we kind of get the same attitude. I'll just put it on a very small scale. Say you have expectations for the, the Phillies, right? The baseball team. All right, they get new players. They spend millions of dollars. They're going to be this wonderful team that goes so far. And then they lose and lose and lose again. You see, what happens is people with high expectations end up flip-flopping into hatred. It's like, what a bunch of bums. They can't even play anything. I'm never going to watch them again. You understand what I'm saying? That's exactly what they did with Jesus. But what do you expect? Let's ask the merchants in the temple. These guys are, are there, and they're selling uh, doves. They're selling sacrificial things. They're exchanging money and making a profit. And if you were to stick a microphone in their face and say, what do you expect from Jesus? Their answer would probably be one word. No. We don't expect anything from this guy. Because life is all about money. It's not about some spiritual thing. It's not about some book that God wrote. It's about making money. It's about the stuff. And so they had no expectations of Jesus, except that maybe Jesus would get more of a crowd that would come. That would mean more money for them. That's nice. What about the sick and the diseased? I find it so amazing that Jesus facing uh, just a week more of life where he's going to be, in one week, put on a cross where he still is ministering to people, still concerned for others. So as he goes into Jerusalem, into the temple area, he willingly stops and people are brought to him that are sick and diseased. What do the sick and diseased expect? What do they want? They want Jesus to show them compassion and love. And he does. He loves them. He places his hands on them. And the scriptures tell us that they are healed because of his great power. Let's ask the children, okay? You've got to get down on knee level and come to the child. And you say, what do you expect from Jesus? And do you know what they would probably say? Huh? I don't know. <laughs> right? Because children don't understand this whole idea of expectations. They mainly just live in the moment. Right? And all they can say is they're just enjoying the presence of Jesus. Wow, we have a lot to learn from children. You know, we think they understand the least, but sometimes they understand a whole lot more than we know. Because our expectations can be filled with fear. We can have all these worries. And the children are living in the moment, just loving Jesus. Expectations. What do you expect? Let's ask the chief priests and the teachers of the law. Those who should know. After all, they're people of the book. But you know what their expectations are? Completely negative. The only thing we expect from Jesus is that he is going to make this place a lot worse. I mean, look at the people that are following him. The whole city's gone after him. And the Romans, they're going to be upset. Pilate, they're going to get their their uh, people together and they're going to not only drive Jesus out, but they probably put all kinds of restrictions on our government and it might just collapse. So everything they expected of Jesus was negative. 
we have to get rid of this guy. He's a nuisance. He's a problem. Expectations. What about the disciples? What did the disciples expect? Now, I have to tell you, when I read the Bible, I see in the disciples so much like us. Because so often the disciples are clueless. And Jesus, oh, I hear him say again and again, don't you have any faith? And he says, how long do I have to put up with you? I know Jesus says that to me sometimes, you know, don't you have faith? Don't you, can't you believe? And then finally he said, when they showed some faith, he says, at last you believe. And so the disciples really don't get it. They think a little bit about the fact that Jesus is their king, and they know that there's a kingdom coming, but they think that Jesus is going to overthrow the Romans like some of the others, and they're just kind of getting in and not getting in sometimes and getting in again. But one thing to their credit is that even though they don't understand it all, they obey Jesus, and they're with him. Okay? So that is huge. Because so much of the success in life is just showing up. Okay? They don't get it, but they show up. And they're with Jesus. And they're going to get it. Now, all these different groups of people we've interviewed really quick. Okay? I've saved the most important person to interview for last. Okay? Here it is. Ask yourself. Okay, look into your own heart. What do you expect from Jesus? You might say, well, I don't expect, I don't expect anything. Well, I have news for you. If you expect nothing, then you'll get it every time. <laughs> the Bible says, in verse 5. See, your king comes to who? You. See, Jesus didn't just come to Jerusalem. Jesus, as the king, comes to you. And he comes to me. And he gets in our face and he says, What do you expect? What do you really believe? According to your faith, so be it unto you. The king has come. And I don't understand it all. But I know that Jesus Christ has changed my life in a way that I could never have imagined. I can't understand how when Jesus was crucified that I somehow was crucified with him. Amen. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. I am crucified with Christ and nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. Amen. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I don't understand it, but I believe it. Yeah. And I don't understand how when Jesus died, that his death becomes my death. I don't get it. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits at the right hand of God. Amen. For you are dead and your life is hidden with God in Christ. Amen. I don't get it. But I know that when he died, that I can proclaim my death to sin. That sin doesn't have to be your master. You can stand above sin because Jesus conquered sin. His death becomes your death. Now I don't get it. I don't understand it. But his resurrection... Becomes my resurrection. 
It wasn't just that I died to things that are evil. It's that I came out of the tomb with Jesus and lived for the first time. Now, I don't know about you, but I remember being dead. And I didn't like it. You know, maybe some of you, you know, you, or people that you know, they're, they're dead in sins and they're thinking they're having a great time. I didn't like it. I knew they had to be something more. Amen. But in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, wow, he raised me to life and showed me what life is all about. That's why John 10, 10 says, I have come. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life. And Jesus in John chapter 8 says, I have come as light into the world. I am the light of the world. And John 3, verse 19, light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. So Jesus has come. What do you, what do you expect? Oh, but here's some good news too. Jesus is coming back. Amen. And I'll give you a clue. He's not going to be riding a little donkey. Amen. Okay? That was a symbol of humility, a symbol of King David also coming into Jerusalem. But he's not going to ride a donkey anymore. Amen. He's not coming to die. He's not coming to suffer. He's coming because he's going to judge the world. Amen. Every wicked thing that people do in this world that they think they get away with, he's going to judge it. So I'd rather have my sins judged on the cross of Jesus than judged in me. Because it's going to be judged one way or another. Amen. He's going to take this crazy messed up planet and he's going to make something out of it. Because his kingdom that is now spiritual will one day be seen over all the earth. Amen. You can bank on it. Habakkuk. Amen. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4 says that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord shall fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. That's what the book says. I believe it. Now, what am I talking about today? We're almost done and you're thinking to yourself, Pastor, what's the main point of this message? I'm so glad that you asked that because here it is. Here it is. Put your hope in King Jesus. Can you say it with me? Say it Put your hope in King Jesus. Now, hope is just a small word for the word expectation. Put your expectation in King Jesus. So, what do you expect? Put your expectations in Him, and you won't be ashamed. You know what we do as a mistake? We put our expectations in what we think Jesus should do. Mm. When Jesus came riding down that trail to Jerusalem, most of the people expected that he would take over, to take charge. They didn't expect him to die. But put your hope in Jesus, not in what you expect that he should do. Hello? Amen. I have a friend who was in prison, and uh, he led the worship in prison. I would go in there and preach. And... Uh, Real good guy. Love God. And he had been in there a long time and had been praying and been praying because his uh, parole board was coming up and he just felt in his heart, that, you know, I've been doing such a good job. And I think that Jesus owes me. I believe that I'm going to be let out of here. That was his expectation. That Jesus, I'm following you and I believe you should spring me out of here. I've done my time. Well, the time came, the parole board met, and he was not released. His whole faith just was like flushed down the toilet. Because his faith was in what he thought Jesus should do, not in Jesus himself. And you see the difference? Hello? If you put your faith just in what you think that he should do, Always have your faith in Jesus. Now, when He speaks to you and tells you about something from the Word or from in your heart and you know that something's going to happen, by faith, then you hang on to that too. But put your faith in Jesus. This past Friday night, my wife and I went to a funeral viewing of a, a good friend of ours that we knew from college, a pastor named Abe Oliver, Pastor Lighthouse Church. You've been there, most of you. He passed away. 
if his family or that church family just had their expectations in him being healed, then they would all be wasted. They would all be like, well, we can't believe anymore because it didn't happen. No. In fact, it was about a year ago, God gave him a miraculous healing and he had this length of time left with the people. But the reason the family could be radiant and could be filled with hope because they know that their husband and pastor is with Jesus. Amen. And folks, if we can kind of connect with him right now and ask him to come back, he say, no, 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 no. I've done my job. I'm finished. I'm staying with Jesus. Why come back when you're homeless? And so what I'm saying is we put our hope in Jesus, not in something just that we think the way that Jesus should work. When you have your hope in Jesus, you can have this verse ringing in your heart. Read it with me. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame. Stand with me and say it again. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame. You'll never be ashamed if you trust Jesus. Amen. Amen.